thank you very much. Uh, good morning. My name is Paco. I'm from a company called Concurrent in San Francisco. And can you all hear me in the, in the back? Okay. Great. Thank you very much. Um, at Concurrent, we work on an open source project called Cascading. It's been around for about five years. It has a, a lot of buy-in throughout uh, enterprise and startups as well. And I'd like to do some introduction to that today. So um, uh, we work a lot with, you know, general class would be enterprise apps for big data. And I'd like to give a bit of an introduction to what cascading is, uh, some of the reasons for using it. And then I want to dive a little bit more into what's the context, um, some of the history of what we call big data, how we got to this point, uh, a little bit of the context of Hadoop. We do a lot of work with MapReduce and uh, a little bit of, of data science work as well. And then I'll go into a, a tutorial that we have for cascading and show a couple of sample apps that we have up on GitHub. Um, I'm a data scientist at Concurrent, and I have kind of a, a dual background. On one side, I have the math, stats, operations research, and doing that kind of quantitative work. On the other side, I, I did my grad work in distributed systems, uh, computer science. I've spent a lot of time in uh, software engineering in general. For about the past 10 years, I've been leading data teams, uh, what would now generally be called data science teams. And some of them were pretty innovative. We had some pretty big problems to tackle. So I'd like to share some of those experiences with you. And as far as the graphic, uh, we are perpetually faced with a lot of unstructured data, mountains of it. So it's usually a problem of finding a needle in a haystack. And unfortunately, uh, strange things happen to the haystacks. So as far as the, the intention for cascading, uh, you know, the basic mission is we're trying to simplify data processing. Uh, we really address a, a couple of major audiences. One is at, at the apps layer, uh, developer productivity with big data apps. And the other is to enable a lot more visibility into how the apps are running in operations. So there's a few facts about cascading. Uh, it's a Java open source project. It's now Apache license. It uses Git and Gradle, Maven, JUnit, et cetera. It's been around for almost five years, and we have uh, hundreds of deployments, uh, large-scale Hadoop deployments. And, and that may sound like a small number, but in reality, when you look at the number of enterprise Hadoop deployments out there right now, uh, that's, that's pretty good. It's pretty good coverage. A lot of finance, healthcare, transportation, uh, some other verticals. Uh, as well, there are some very large deployments at places like Twitter, Etsy, uh, Climate Corp, Williams-Sonoma, uh, Square. Most all of those have had articles out recently. Uh, Amazon has done a case study on Climate Corp, which is one of their biggest customers for Amazon uh, Elastic MapReduce service. Uh, they've also done case study on Flycaster, another, another big one. We have partnerships here with, uh, with Spring as well as with Amazon. Uh, with Microsoft for Hadoop on Azure. Uh, we also have distribution partnerships with Hortonworks, MapR, and EMC. Um, in addition to our open source project, there are several others that are built on top of it. There are several integrations and DSLs put on top. Twitter has been the biggest. Uh, Twitter acquired, I think, two different firms doing that, plus they had their own open house, or sorry, their own in-house project. So now they've got three major projects on top of us. We do integration, not just Hadoop, but how Hadoop works alongside with other systems. So we have integration with HBase, uh, JDBC connectors, uh, memcache, et cetera. Uh, and serialization is usually a pretty big thing for getting data in and out of Hadoop. So uh, we have integration with Thrift and Avro, a couple of the big uh, popular ones. At the end of the day, what happens with cascading is you take all of your business logic and it's compiled down, the entire app is one jar file. And that's interesting. It's, it's different from, say, using uh, more scripted approaches to Hadoop, like Hive or Pig. Um, those tools are great. They're really great for getting in and looking at data. Uh, if you don't exactly know what you're going for, you want to slice and dice your data, do some discovery. But what Cascading provides you is the ability to take your entire app and reduce it down to a jar file. 
So you've got one connected space defining your app, so your, your compiler is looking across all of that. Um, your exception handling is in common throughout all of that. Your debugging is in common throughout all of that. The trouble with doing uh, some of the other scripted approaches is you end up with a lot of different scripts, some XML, some Python, some SQL, and trying to debug across those boundaries gets to be complex for, for enterprise workflows. Uh, in terms of what other people are saying, there was a, a good description out of CIO um, uh, this summer. And the, the gist of it is that cascading provides an abstraction layer on top of Hadoop so that if your team has experienced Java developers, you don't have to go learning a whole lot about the internals of Hadoop. You can use that abstraction layer and get going quickly. Um, a few different articles have, have had that, that gist of a review. Um, we also we got, um, we got some notice in the InfoWorld Bossy Awards this year. We got one of the Bossy Awards for, uh, for open source database. And uh, again, <clears throat> it, it provides an abstraction layer that's an improvement over trying to build apps in native MapReduce or trying to use uh, PIG with user-defined functions. Okay, I, I want to throw out something from Steve Yegi. How many people have read Steve Yegi's stuff? All right, good. Uh, so uh, Steve Yegi is at Google, and he, he came up with this, uh, this one article that's intentionally supposed to be uh, controversial. The idea is that he's proposing a political spectrum in pro programming environments. So on one side, you've got a, the conservative end of the spectrum, which is typically enterprise, not always, but um, you know, you're, you're, you're more interested in, in assurance, making sure that your apps run correctly. Whereas on the other side is a more uh, liberal kind of programming environment where you're more interested in having the flexibility to just try things and see what sticks. Um, Enterprise generally represents conservative. There's definitely some startups I know that are they're highly conservative. Um, there's also some very, very large firms that were fit squarely in the liberal camp. But typically you see uh, JVM-based languages more on the conservative side. You see the interpreted languages like PHP and Ruby more on the liberal side. And it's, it breaks down to, uh, you know, one side wants no surprises and the other side wants no impediments. And in terms of working with the abstraction layers on top of Hadoop, uh, we, we see this represented in our customer base as well. And I've led teams that had very large deployments of Hive before and Hadoop streaming, and you know, they, were, they were in a kind of environment where it really fit. That's exactly what we needed to do. But for our customers, they tend to be more on the conservative side. And if you think about this, you know, if you're Pinterest and you want to push out some changes and just see how it looks, you know, if, if there's a couple of bugs that get introduced for a little while, it's really not a problem. Um, it's, it's all in the name of innovation. On the other hand, you don't want your bank or your airline or your hospital to be going down that direction anytime soon. So we see that in these kind of verticals, in finance and transportation and health. We definitely see a, a lot more conservative approach to big data. And the implication there is that as enterprise is moving more and more into big data frameworks, moving more into Hadoop, um, the risk profiles for these kind of apps are shifting away from early adopter into more enterprise button-down environments. And along with that, we're seeing cascading as a popular API for managing enterprise data workflows. And data workflows is really our view of the world. That's our starting point. Uh, Chris Wenzel is the author of Cascading. He was a system architect at Thompson, uh, and he was, in, he was working on the FineLaw project, and they had very, very large ETL batch jobs. And the thing there is you've got a lot of data provenance issues. You've got a lot of different sources. Uh, if one of those sources falls out of copyright or is corrupted and you propagate bad results down through your ETL chain, uh, there's, there's a lot of consequences on the end for the, the law firms consuming that. So uh, Chris was working with the people on the Nutch project back before Hadoop actually had a name. And he was trying some of the stuff out, and he was, uh, from an enterprise perspective, as, as a Java developer leading a team of Java developers, he was very upset that uh, he couldn't tie it down better. So he came up with this abstraction layer. And at the end of the day, it's plumbing. We, we look at, at sources of data. We look at sinks. We connect those with pipes. And we put different types of operations, filters, uh, joins, etc., in the pipes. 
And so that's how the API, that's really our way of visualizing it. And in fact, whenever we're troubleshooting with somebody remotely, like over email, one of the first things we do is ask for a flow diagram. Because when the app runs, it generates these as dot files. So the, the workflows are an abstraction, and they mean different things to different people on the team. From a, a, a business perspective, from a stakeholder perspective, you're talking about your business process management. You're talking about orchestrating these large workflows for big data. Uh, at the same time, from, a, from an integrator perspective, uh, you're not just describing Hadoop, because Hadoop is really almost never used in isolation. You almost always are taking data from somewhere else, putting it into Hadoop, processing, batch jobs, moving it somewhere else. So uh, cascading works not just with Hadoop, but with other frameworks as well, and the apps include touching all these different frameworks. From my perspective, as a data scientist, I look at this as a directed acyclic graph. I look at every app as generating this kind of data flow, dependency graph. And we can do a lot of transforms on a graph like that to optimize. Uh, but at the end of the day, you know, it all gets compiled down to a jar file. And that's, you, know, you put that through CI and you drop it in your Maven repo and IT goes and schedules it on the cluster. Uh, we changed the format a little bit here. Um, I'll, I'll definitely be publishing the slides, but there may be a little bit of shift. Anyway, uh, taking a look at those different perspectives, I can break down the abstraction into a few layers. Again, there's business process up at the top, and then in, in terms of coding, uh, there's definitely Java is, is what we build cascading in, but there's DSLs for Scala and Clojure, uh, as well as uh, Python, Ruby, Groovy as well. When we build an application, we're really building toward a physical plan. The plumbing is a physical plan. So if you think of a query in SQL having a, you know, a logical plan and a physical plan, we're down a bit lower. And then when the app runs, we collect data against it to ostensibly to provide backup to the logical planning. So if I, if I were to take a SQL query and break it down, there's a, a lot of parts, sort of the devil you know here. There's, there's definitely the parser, where you're bringing in SQL scripts. And then from there, you've got the planner from a, a logical standpoint and your optimization, which is based on stats that are collected about the tables about running these queries. Uh, you've got a physical plan below that. You've got the, the data that you've collected. And eventually, you're down. You're hitting B trees, et cetera, and, and down in, in the real substrate of where the calculation gets done. Uh, when you try to visualize a, a query, you're looking at ERDs. Um, and the, the, the way of, of managing the data is really expressed in terms of table schema. And uh, the sum of that is going to be a catalog. So <clears throat> in terms of cascading apps, uh, we, are, we, we recently uh, had uh, some people inadvertently announce this. But we, uh, we haven't done a whole lot publicly yet with it. But we have a SQL 92 compliant parser, uh, which we have running uh, back at the lab. And that's anticipated to be going out as open source uh, a little bit later this year. And the idea is that you drop SQL in and really, you're generating Java on the other side. Um, the Java, of course, is the API, the plumbing, the flows. And from that, we collect app history. We collect data about the tuples that are flowing through the graph. So we have a lot of the same kind of data that you get about your, your stats inside of your, uh, your query planning engine. Instead of an ERD, we've got a flow diagram. Instead of table schema, we've got tuple schema that we measure. And then, at, and the sum total of this is, much like a catalog, we keep track of all the data endpoints that you're touching. And we look at the history of that over time, how those are changing. OK, so that's a, a brief intro to cascading. I'll come back to it, and I'll show a tutorial and a, and a couple of sample apps. But I want to go back into some of the origins of big data, give a little bit of context of, of why we came to this point. Uh, I like to point out a, a time, an inflection point in the industry, which was Q3, 1997. And at the time, there were a, a few different firms working along very similar lines. Uh, there was Greg Linden's team at Amazon and Randy Shoup's team at eBay. As well, uh, there was Eric Brewer's team at Inktomi, which became Yahoo Search. And the folks at Google were still at, at Stanford at this point, but they spun out the year later. 
what happened with Greg Linden and Randy Shoup and, and their teams respectively, they, they came up with pretty much the same approach rather than scaling up and, and buying larger and larger Sun hardware, they had the idea that they could take their workloads and parallelize them and scale them out horizontally. And so these teams got this in place in Q3. And in Q4 1997, that's when the real big tsunami of e-commerce hit. And that's when Amazon and eBay and, and others began to see these big successes. So they were in place a few months before they were able to handle that traffic when it hit that holiday season. The way that I like to characterize it is if you look at the amount of revenue that you're getting per customer and you divide that by the amount of data that you're storing per customer, after this inflection point, that metric just fell through the floor. And it's largely because we started collecting a lot more log files about customers. And if you think about it, um, I guess one way to illustrate is when you look at online advertising, you've got your impression data, those log files are orders of magnitude larger than your click data which is also orders of magnitude larger than your conversion data. So you've got this needle in a haystack problem. You may have thousands of impressions, but only one actual sale. So we collected a lot more data about customers now, and we started using it, these teams in particular. Um, now the conventional wisdom of business intelligence and relational databases and the, and the tools that we had previously for slicing and dicing data, those really didn't hold anymore. They didn't really work with orders of magnitude increase suddenly. MapReduce and consequently Hadoop came directly out of this time. Um, they don't necessarily solve all the problems, um, but, but they've definitely been helpful. The consequence of this change, actually I should ask, how many people have ever read uh, uh, Jeffrey Moore? Anybody here? So there's a book that was really popular called Crossing the Chasm. And uh, in business schools, uh, the MBAs pretty much have to read this book. Uh, Jeffrey Moore spoke at Hadoop Summit last, uh, last summer. And I was actually, I was going to skip it. it. It didn't really sound all that interesting. But a, a friend of mine who, uh, who runs part of a business school texted me and, and said that she'd fly down just to see that talk. So, um, you know, I, I went in and the point that he was making is that what Amazon did in retail, or rather did to retail, um, what Google did to advertising, what what Apple went and did to arguably several different sectors. Um, Jeffrey Moore is making the point that this is going to happen across the different verticals. It's going to happen throughout the global 1000. And it will be a matter of apps, enterprise apps, verticals, that knocks this down. And he foresees displacement throughout the global 1000, throughout the next decade, but in particular, cresting in the next three to five year period. Uh, similarly, Michael Stonebreaker, I was at a conference with him um, a couple months ago, and he's not the world's biggest fan of the term big data, but he is responsible for a lot of very interesting work with SQL over the years. And his view is that now complex analytics, these kind of workloads are displacing SQL as the real basis for enterprise apps. I usually get asked for primary sources about this, so uh, as far as Amazon, eBay, um, uh, Eric Brewer from Yahoo, Inktomi, uh, Jeff Dean from Google, there's some really great stories. They're, they're written uh, or, or spoken by the actual tech leads on those teams. Uh, so they give a lot of insight to that inflection point in 97 and what happened in the few years that followed. If I were to characterize it, you know, rolling back to just before then, 1996, this was a world before we had servlets. And back then we were doing CGI. I remember a lot of C++ and Perl and, and other things being used for, for that we were writing CGI in. Uh, and transactions would drop into a database, you'd do some SQL queries, you'd have some analysts that would you know, do some pivot tables and produce a, a slide deck. And that would go to some business decision maker. So there's a feedback loop, but it had a lot of manual steps. And the analysis was based on what, in statistics, what we call data modeling, where you, you've got your data set and you clean it all up and, and you, you fit it to some sort of distribution and pretty much throw the data away and just make uh, inference off that, that distribution. What happened after the successes of Amazon and eBay and, um, you know, as well, LinkedIn is, is very exemplary of this. You see a, a different kind of feedback loop. Um, definitely we were running much larger distributed web apps on top of much more sophisticated middleware. 
But from that, from that we see the, the collection of social interaction, social events, customer events, being dropped into logs. And from those logs, aggregation feeding into something called algorithmic modeling. And from that, the products were recommendation systems, like Amazon's, people who read this book also read other books, or LinkedIn with people you may know. Um, also classifiers, such as what we use in antifraud in e-commerce. So this red here, the feedback loop there, is really interesting because instead of pulling a SQL query and you know, doing a, a pivot table and doing a PowerPoint slide deck and, and handing it to a VP, now you're seeing millions of events per day uh, where there's automated algorithmic modeling making those decisions. The humans are still in it. They're guiding it. They're, they're improving it. They're testing it. Um, but this data, again, a couple of orders of magnitude growth, was largely automated. Now, the world that we, we see now with our, our customers from Concurrent, the, the people doing very large-scale cascading, um, it's more complex. On the right-hand side, you've still got the, the software development life cycle. You've still got product and engineering and ops. Um, arguably, you know, over the past decade, we've seen that picture, that stack become much more complex. There's more cache layers in there between the database and the customer, obviously. But the other thing that's interesting is uh, the data is not managed in terms of one size fits all. It's not just a data warehouse anymore. You've probably still got your data warehouse and your data marts, but you've also got Hadoop for batch. You've got some, um, you know, you've got your log events, maybe some complex event processing or, or some kind of streaming over the top of the logs, Splunk, etc. And then you've also got in-memory data grids. We're seeing a lot more of that. Like for instance, Twitter has Storm. Uh, tuple spaces probably fit this too. On the left-hand side, in contrast to the software development lifecycle, we've got more of a, a data science capability. And in data science work, we see these four roles repeatedly. There's the domain expert, the stakeholder, product owner. There's the scientist, there's the developer, and there's ops. And when I've built teams, I keep these roles in mind. People may have overlap between them, but we always focus on those four roles. What's interesting is that um, the data science side is a very heavy consumer of different types of data access patterns. We look at them in particular, we, we talk about them as almost as design patterns that you have in, uh, in Java, in, in software engineering. The feedback loop that's happening now that's causing a much larger increase of data uh, is something that's been talked about at, at the conference so far. I've seen in other talks, but I'd like to characterize it differently. It's really about machine data, and it's about machine data being used to optimize clusters, very large resources. So we see a feedback loop from the data that we collect off of running our data apps, driving planners, driving schedulers, and being used to actually change, for instance, how you handle your multi-tenancy in your cluster, how you, you handle the priorities of apps being driven through very large Hadoop deployments. Twitter is a really good example of this. Twitter's one of the largest uh, implementations for cascading. They also use a system called Mesos for their, their cluster scheduling underneath. And they can take data and feed it down into the scheduler level and do some pretty amazing things. Uh, one, of my, one of my friends actually uh, had created Mesos for his PhD project. He's working at Twitter now. And he goes out and does a demo with uh, maybe a half dozen people from Twitter, op Twitter ops in the front row. And they, uh, they pull up the master node that's running 40,000 cores for all of their revenue system, all their ad placement. And it's, it's literally all the money coming into Twitter. They pull up the master node and shoot it, <laughs> and then time how long it takes to come back. And literally, it's seconds later. So there are some fairly ex advanced patterns, but it has to do with machine data being able to feed into that. Similarly, the notion of collecting data about apps is uh, not just isolated to data science. Uh, I was at a conference recently with uh, some people from Lawrence Livermore, and uh, they were talking about the fusion experiments that they do. And when they run the, the ignition, they've got a little piece of metal and they've got a, a building that's the size of two soccer fields. Um, they actually collect more data about the machine than they do about the physics experiment. And, and that's a really important point. When you think about it, they have to be sure that the machine behaved correctly if they're going to believe the results from the physics experiment. And I, I heard numbers of like four to one ratio. There's more data coming off the machine than the physics. And of course, the physics part has 
enormous amounts of data. Um, that's the kind of world we're seeing, and that's the kind of world we're leveraging. Now, a key difference in, in this is something called statistical thinking. And this is what I had drilled into me back uh, my, myself and my peers in, in, in grad school. Um, the notion is that you have a, a business process. You've got some interaction of different variables. Over the top of that, you've got variation. And over the top of that, you're collecting your data. And over the top of that, you're using your tools to analyze your data, which inherently has a lot of variation in it. So uh, this is something that um, requires not just logic, but a lot of analytical reasoning. It's, it's very different than what we usually encounter in software engineering. Um, consequently, what I see amongst my peers uh, in, in data science is about half of them are from physics, or physical sciences, physical engineering. But really, about half of my peers in data science are physicists. And that kind of makes sense, because if you're a graduate student in physics, you have to handle a bunch of sensor arrays, collect a lot of data, it's usually really dirty, needs to be cleaned up. You end up having to go learn a bunch of Linux tools to clean up that data. You do some statistical analysis of it and produce those results. And you have to do all that before your appointment with your grad advisor the next week. And you have to do all that before you actually get to the physics. So you know, I've hired about 30 people onto data science teams over the past few years. And I've recruited pretty heavily from uh, physics, aero astro, uh, environmental engineering, etc. And I know that these people can come into an e-commerce firm and be doing data science work on day one because they know how to use R and MATLAB, they know how to use Hadoop, Python, etc. Um, it's interesting that, you know, speaking as a computer scientist, speaking as a, a, an engineering manager for software predominantly, um, programmers typically don't think this way. The concept of, of variation is not something you expect. Um, but systems engineers usually understand this better. I mean, if you deploy a thousand nodes in a cluster, you expect a certain number of disks to fail. Um, and data, science, data scientists, of course, have to really work this way. There's a, a really great article. Uh, if you have just one takeaway from this talk, I, I definitely recommend reading this article. It's by a, a stats prof at Berkeley called Leo Bremen. Uh, he was also very hands-on uh, in terms of industry work. But he did a paper called Two Cultures, and it contrasts the notion of data modeling versus algorithmic modeling as far as cultures. It's really kind of a biography of what happened on the rise of Google, how this whole big data shift happened. And it's highly entertaining because he, he stepped on a lot of toes. He, he really upset a lot of ranking statistics professors throughout the world, many of whom wrote in rebuttals. And he published those along with very humorous responses. Some of my professors are actually among them. Um, so I, I highly recommend this paper. It's, it's very accessible, and it, it really shows the difference in thinking. OK, uh, real quick, I, I just want to do a little bit of over overview of Hadoop, and what that means, what we use. So um, Hadoop comes out of uh, the MapReduce paper out of Google. And really, that was something that Google was doing a decade ago. Um, when I, I talk to my friends at Google now, they're really about three generations beyond the context of Hadoop. They still use MapReduce, but they use it along with a lot of other very sophisticated systems. So it's interesting because industry is embracing Hadoop now, but really Google is already 10 years ahead. Um, MapReduce, as far as architecture, you've got a cluster, you've got a name node that's looking at all your distributed data, your data nodes. You've got a job tracker that's keeping track of all your distributed task trackers. You've got a submit queue for where you send your jobs in. Um, there's a distributed file system underlying all of it so that you have fault tolerance. So if a node dies suddenly, uh, its neighbors has data, it can pick up jobs. There's also a distributed cache that gets used if you want to stick little pieces of data out into the cluster, uh, not into the, sorry, into the distributed file system. As far as how sorry, MapReduce, how it works in general, um, you've got map functions and reduce functions. They take keys and values, they produce keys and values, and they do some manipulations along the way. These are tuples of data. I don't want to throw out too much math, but that's, that's really the, the formal description of MapReduce. Um, it relies on a property called data independence, which says that if you've got one key with a bunch of values, whatever you're going to do to that is completely separate from another key and its values. 
And as long as you can keep that independence, you can send those tasks off in different directions, have them run on different processors. Um, I apologize, the format is a little weird because we, we shifted to a different format here. Um, but at the end of the day, MapReduce is about fault tolerance. It's not about speed. It's about being able to leverage a bunch of commodity hardware without having to buy a bunch of big iron. And that was the notion of horizontal scale-out. And we're still seeing that today, even though probably the commodity hardware that you use for, for Hadoop is not exactly going to be your PC. Um, there's a great story about this that Jeff Dean has from the talk that I, I have listed. Uh, in the early days, after they'd moved out MapReduce at Google into production, uh, they were monitoring some jobs in one of the, the data warehouses. And these were jobs that were enormous. They would take up most of the resources of, of a, uh, uh, a data center. And they noticed that this one critical job was running slow. And, and it completed, but they watched it very carefully. And it ran about 30% longer than what was anticipated, what had been done before. And so they drilled down to that, and they called up and tried to see what was going on in the data center. As it turned out, the engineers were, were powering down the racks one by one and flipping them out with new equipment. And they were doing that. They changed out most of the data center while this job was running. And it ran 30% slower, but it still had the same results. You know, they're going, wow, OK, well, that's about fault tolerance. That's about using commodity hardware for fault tolerance. Um, I'm not going to digging into this too much, but it, there's a few citations here as far as the history. Um, a lot of what we do with, with Hadoop with MapReduce really comes out of things that were being done in the late 70s and early 80s in Lisp and Prolog, and uh, I, I was a grad student back then. I remember a lot of that. Um, but, you know, that led to more formalisms for parallel processing. Uh, of course, Google was the one who really pushed this and, and actually made a lot of their results public. Um, Apache Hadoop came out of the Nudge project that was adopted by Yahoo. And uh, actually, one of my teams was very much involved with Amazon. Um, I've been working with AWS for really since they went public in 2006. In circa 2008, I was at a company called Ad Knowledge. Uh, it's a large ad network uh, out of Kansas City. And uh, I had a team which, um, uh, like 80% of revenue, had gone through this one. 1500 line SQL query and it was running on Tisa hardware and the problem was that the query I mean this is a typical enterprise workload <clears throat> but the problem was that the query took about 13 hours to run and it was responsible for most of revenue for the next day and it was failing deep into it probably at about hour 11 it was failing meantime between failures about four days so really about twice a week we were seeing these failures that hit revenue hit bottom line really hard and my team was called in to reverse engineer that and move it out into Hadoop. And we, we put it on AWS. We, uh, we took $3 million of Netiza CapEx off the table and replaced it with $400 a day initially on Amazon for OpEx. And then we cut that, that figure in half eventually through some optimizations. Um, after we had this running for uh, a month or two, um, Amazon called up and said, hey, uh, we saw what you did. <laughs> and you're, you're one of the largest installations of Hadoop on Amazon. So um, when can we get together for coffee? And, and as a consequence, my team was a guinea pig. Uh, they used this as a case study for putting together the Elastic MapReduce uh, uh, service. Um, from a more formal perspective, in, in computer science, the, the real guiding light here is something called CAP theorem. And uh, the notion of CAP theorem, this actually came out of uh, Eric Brewer, who led Inktomi, uh, he was a, a Berkeley prof. Um, Inktomi got acquired by Yahoo, became Yahoo Search. Uh, Eric Brewer is now director of operations at Google. Um, but what he noticed over, over and over again in terms of horizontal scale out is that you have these three properties. You have uh, strong consistency of your data. Uh, that is to say that if you go out and query it at time A and you haven't done any ch updates to it, then at time B, uh, it should be the same results. There's also the notion of availability, which is to say that if, um, say I've got a sharded database, I can still make a query across the entire space, across all the shards at once. Um, and then there's the notion of partition tolerance, which is to say sharding your database using horizontal scale-up. In the best scenario, if you do everything right, you get to pick two 
companies like Google try very, very hard to get close to having all three properties simultaneously, and they spend billions doing it. So realistically, in terms of parallel processing and horizontal scale-out, this is about the cost of doing business. Uh, Julian Brown, the link at the bottom, has a, a really great analysis of it. It's actually a very entertaining read. It's also very controversial, because the, the people behind Acid, behind SQL, Michael Stonebreaker and all, they really don't like this idea at all. But what it tells us is how to understand data access patterns. And these are like design patterns for big data. So the idea is if you've got CAP, consistency, availability, partition tolerance, and you get to pick two, then the one that you give up characterizes your data access pattern. And it characterizes, it tells you what kind of frameworks you probably need to use underneath. So I try to take a stab at that, and I try to show that based on, on the data access pattern, what kind of framework is indicated, and what sort of cap theorem forfeits are involved. And in particular, down at the bottom here in green, um, you know, with Hadoop, you, you want your data to be consistent, but it's, it's distributed. So you're giving up availability. You can't query all the data in Hadoop from one query at the same point in time. And that's where data independence comes in. You've split the data up, you've split the tasks up. They can each look at their part, but you can't get a whole picture until the batch job is done. So you're giving up availability for the sake of having partition tolerance and having this, this scale out. Um, one of the, the problems of this is that inside of, of MapReduce, inherently, part of it's parallel, part of it is serial. We work very hard to make as much of it parallel as possible. But at the end of the day, you can't do it 100%. And that really speaks to um, how many are familiar with Amdahl's law for, for uh, measuring uh, parallelism. So that really speaks to that, is that currently what we see with Hadoop, it'll get you pretty far with parallelism, but it could do better. What I've seen, I, I was at a, a conference this summer with uh, a bunch of people who work on gigapixel telescopes, for instance. Uh, astrophysicists, and you know they have like 120 terabyte per second data rates coming off of each telescope, hitting the wire, hitting the logs, and the kind of algorithms that they're working with just to be able to scan through a full sky scan and then pinpoint the, the telescope, um, it's orders of magnitude beyond what we see in e-commerce. And it, it's going to be a few years before that kind of research hits industry, but when it does, it's, it's going to make some changes. And meanwhile, the hardware developers, you know, we're seeing fusion cores, we're seeing a lot of advances as far as storage coming into memory. Um, you know, what's projected to happen three years, five years, ten years out on that is, is pretty amazing. NetApp in particular has some, some great projections on that, um, as does AMD. As far as references for Hadoop, uh, Tom White, when I was at Ad Knowledge, I actually hired him as a consultant for our team. And uh, he, he put out a great book uh, a year or two later um, called Hadoop, The Definitive Guide from O'Reilly. And I definitely recommend that. I'm also an O'Reilly author, so I plug O'Reilly books as much as I can. Um, but on that note, let me talk a little bit about data science, about how we do what we do. So um, in this context of big data, we want to do something with it. And when, when I talk about data science, our, our teams, we talk about building... Um, creating actionable insights, and being able to describe the confidence for what we're recommending, for the, the decisions. And it, it may be you know, really a few really big decisions, but generally speaking, it's a lot of really small decisions. So something like AdWords or LinkedIn would probably be a good example. At any case, um, it's almost always an interdisciplinary pursuit. It's, it's a matter of having teams that work together. You can't just go out and hire a data scientist to take care of all the problems, because really it's a matter of a lot of people working together. Uh, what we find in our, our work is that over and over again, project after project, 80% of the cost, or something close to that, is all about cleaning up the data, preparing the data. So at the end of the day, for data science, most of our work product is cleaning up the data. And maybe that sounds trivial, but when you think about it, if you've got terabytes or petabytes of unstructured data, and the business people don't know what's in there, they, they don't even know what questions to ask. They have an idea of what they'd like to hear, um, but they want you to go out and clean it up and get some answers. As soon as you provide answers, usually the next question is, oh, and I, I want to find this other thing too. And generally speaking, if you, 
If you didn't know all the requirements in advance, you're going to have to go back to pretty much to step zero and start again. Um, plus, the data is changing. When you look in finance, when you look at transactions, transactions are coming in all the time. So data cleanup is, is what we do. Unfortunately, companies tend to earmark budgets for large frameworks that are useful after the data is cleaned up. So you, you're kind of upside down in that equation. And the thing that fits it together is really the personal skills of the engineers involved. And the, the, the four skills that I see as being most important are, number one, being able to use programmable tools to prepare your data. And I don't mean like Excel macros. I mean something you can have a unit test on. Um, number two, being able to, to generate compelling data visualizations. I've, I've been in the situation, you know, director level, data science, data insights lead. Um, I've been in the situation of being in front of a bunch of vice presidents who are arguing over some business issue that's critical. And you drop a visualization on the table and they stop arguing and they focus on the problem. So visualizations are very key for communication, for getting people to work together. Of course, once you do that, the first thing they're going to say is, well, how confident are you? in these results you're reporting. So being able to estimate confidence is, is critical. We use stats for that. And number four, being able to automate all of the above. And I find these skills on data science teams to be much more important than all of the modeling and algorithms put together. Now, in, in terms of data science, there's definitely a lot of criticism. Um, is it actually science? Is it just a buzzword? Um, haven't we seen this before? Isn't it just analytics with you know, a, a different buzzword? But there is something different. So I, I would characterize it in four terms. Uh, number one, there's a matter of probability estimation. And that's where statistics comes in very handy. That's a very hard problem. Um, there's a city called Las Vegas that, that really understands this very well. Um, people don't really estimate probability all that well. And when you work in higher dimension with lots and lots of data, the problem becomes harder and harder to estimate probability and, and effect. Um, there's also the notion of calculating analytic variance. And variance is very key because, as I said, it's always there. You've got process, variance, data, and tools. And the thing with variance is it tells you how to make bets and how to make million or billion dollar bets in particular. It keeps you from making the bad ones. There's also the matter of order complexity. Computer science, of course, has big O notation. Um, we see that a lot. In data science, we see it in uh, even even worse problems. You know, you see some problems. Uh, there's a lot of interesting work in this area right now, but I, I've seen some recent results where they were taking like order n cubed problems and dropping them down into spaces, refactoring them, transforming them into spaces that were realistically n log n. So we see a lot of refactoring like that, and a lot of it's very experimental, but I, I anticipate that coming out into industry fairly soon. And again, the drivers for that are astrophysics, bioinformatics. Genomics in particular has huge data rates where they do some very advanced statistics. And fourth, there's a lot of use of learning theory. And this really breaks down into two areas. There's statistical learning theory, which is very rigorous and has a long backlog. Um, it's a, a little slow coming in because it requires a lot of math. There's also machine learning, which tends to be much more ad hoc. And machine learning is usually just get the problem done, and there's a bunch of magic numbers all over the place, and you may not actually be able to explain why it works, but it works. Um, the problem there is that you really need both. Um, machine learning is great for solving large-scale business problems. Uh, statistics are what you rely on uh, for your QA, for making sure that you're not making a bad bet. So the stats side of it really prevents you from making billion dollar mistakes, whereas machine learning allows you to make billion dollar mistakes. Um, at the end of the day, though, all these things get reduced down into cron tab entries. That's what we do is automation. So for data science teams, uh, I usually look at five phases. Uh, there's discovery phase, where you're getting into your data, trying to see what sort of questions you could answer. There's modeling which is where you're doing the automation, working with algorithms, moving that out in, into, um, into your cluster. Of course, there's always apps and systems, like we have in software engineering in general. But in the middle is integration. And integration is very tricky. And so with my teams, I tend to be very hands-on. I usually um, do a lot of work in integration. That way I can tell which side is ahead or behind where a team might need to be augmented. I mentioned before about these four roles, uh, a stakeholder, a scientist, developer, ops, 
if you take the cross of that, those five phases, those four roles, then you can really take a look at, at how a project shapes up. What kind of product requirements you have, what kind of team skills you have. If you look at the individuals and where they have overlap, you can and plot that out in this grid here and see where it is that a team might need to have some training or might need to be augmented. I just did a hypothetical one here. Um, usually the business people understand discovery pretty well, so do the statisticians, but usually in the middle, the integrations where you have some things that need to be uh, augmented. I'm, I'm not going to go into this too much, but it's something we use a lot to show the handoffs within the team. Usually there's a people aspect, data science is very social, but at the end of the day you're trying to drive towards automation. So there are some parts that go more towards the people side and more towards the automation side. Uh, also, real briefly, I'll have these in the slides, but I, I just want to show a few use cases that are very typical for big data and data science. Um, one that I've had at almost every e-commerce firm I've worked at is Marketing Funnel. And uh, there's a case study for a large-scale deployment of cascading with Williams-Sonoma, and that's exactly what they're doing, is they've got marketing data coming in from all sides. So they've got a number of different ad partners and marketing strategies, um, things they're doing in social networks and online. They have to take all this data in and put it into, well, number one, there's a lot of ETL, but then number two, they have to put it into a common basis for making decisions. Uh, usually that means aligning a lot of metrics and doing time series analysis and... Um, you know, you want to build models of customer lifetime value. You also want to build models of cost per paying customer and then try to adjust those two. E-commerce fraud is another area for big data for uh, building anti-fraud classifiers. I've done a lot of work in this area with Random Forest. Um, I was at a company where Visa had told them, you know, their limit is 1% fraud. The company was running at a 2% fraud rate and that was in October. Um, they were making most of their money in December, so they were looking at a real existential crisis because Visa gave them a month to clean it up before they shut them down. And, and we found some very interesting things. Number one was they were using uh, kind of a standard business school technique of, of logistic regression uh, to build their fraud models. And what that means is they were trying to solve for the average. They were trying to solve for a typical case of fraud. If you know anything about online fraud, they try to do everything in the book. They, they're very segmented. So you don't have just one case, you have many cases. So we swapped out uh, their algorithm for something called Random Forest, which uses a lot of different trees to describe a lot of different use cases and edge cases. And the other thing the company was doing was they had really sparse data, and uh, whenever they had a missing value, they'd set it to zero, um, which changing that alone um, got us a couple percentage points on, on the uh, error rates. Uh, customer segmentation is also a very hard problem. It's usually where you get into things like social graph and clustering algorithms, trying to understand who and where your customers are and what they're buying. Uh, monetizing content is also something we, we tend to work a lot with in data science, big data. Um, like, for instance, I was at a, a URL sharing network that powers ESPN and Disney and others. Um, and, you know, we had millions of URLs, so we had to go out and build crawlers based on, on, uh, on cascading, actually. Uh, we, built, we built crawlers to go out and grab all of the, the HTML for the documents that were being shared by millions of customers. And then we had to build these workloads uh, that would do text analytics to try to understand the keywords that were in the different documents, try to build topic models for them, and then build recommendations off that, um, powering, like for instance, we did a big project powering Rolling Stone based off that data. And um, at the end of the day, you're trying to align what's in your content online versus what kind of available advertising you have. There's a great reference for uh, data science, building data science teams. Um, my friend DJ Patil was chief scientist at LinkedIn. He's now at Greylock Partners. Um, he's also an O'Reilly author. And these books are free. And they're, they're many books. They're excellent. Um, he has a very product-oriented focus. He also did part of this work with Jeff Hammerbacher, who led the data science team at, at Facebook. Okay, um, right on schedule. So um, I want to jump into cascading a bit more now that we've had some context. And we wrote a tutorial as a set of uh, six blog posts. And we're actually moving this into a book now. But it's a, it was intended so that each blog post could be read and you could cut and paste the code and run it in about 15 minutes. And so we go from the simplest possible cascading app 
uh, just a file copy. We move up in steps until we've actually implemented a pretty interesting machine learning algorithm called TFIDF, sort of the basis for Lucene and other search indexing. And, uh, and it's been fun. We actually, there was a company that pushed out the end result into production. Um, I, I show comparisons not just in Java, but also in Scala and Clojure, based on cascading, and then um, contrast that with uh, Pig and Hive, two other popular methods. So um, the simplest possible cascading app would just be a, a copy. And as I mentioned, in a headed cluster, you've got a distributed file system. So every file is split up in different parts and distributed across your cluster. So the notion of, file, of copying a file from A to B is running in parallel to copy all of those parts. So the simplest program I can write is, uh, it's got a source and a sync and a very simple pipe in between. It's about 10 lines of code in Java based on cascading. 10 lines of code sounds excessive for a file copy, especially when you're used to using tools like DCP or, or just even CP, one line command line to, to file a, a copy a file. But the, the reason is that with cascading, you have a little bit of setup. You know, most of those 10 lines are actually just your setup, and that's constant. But you get a, your app compiled down to a jar, and your jar scales. So you can run that jar file on your laptop, you can run through your unit tests, and maybe run with megabytes of data for your test set, and confirm that your code is behaving the way it's supposed to and then push that out into your continuous integration, into your staging cluster, run it with uh, different endpoints. So I, I mentioned about the graph, the DAG, your app being defined as this dependency graph of different steps. The way that we look at it is the endpoints, the data in and the data out, those can be changed as parameters. That's some dependency that's being injected into this. We just keep those as parameters. So as you move up from your laptop to your staging to your production, you just change the endpoints and you change the cluster underneath. So the same jar ends up being in your Maven repo and IT schedules it for production. That's a very powerful notion. That's what our, our customers like for cascading, especially in finance. Um, if I take that simplest program and I, I take the source document as a, a collection of text documents, and I take and add three operations on that pipeline. I do it. I take the text and I tokenize it, and then I do a group by, and then I do a count. Those three operations now have implemented a word count. So in Java, a word count with cascading looks like this. And it's, it's bigger than what you would see for uh, the default Hadoop example of word count, but it's very tightly instrumented. You've got up at the top, a way to set your, your parameters as your endpoints, so your, your caps coming in and out. You've got a way to inject uh, what your properties are, what your configuration is. And as uh, Kostin was mentioning yesterday, this is where you can integrate with, with Spring to be managing how this app will be running on your cluster. Um, and the rest of it is just connecting up pipes and then running it. Down the bottom, I generate a, a, a dot file, which is the flow diagram. Now, in contrast, if I use cascading in Scala, there's a package that Twitter's done that eBay and Etsy and others have really contributed a lot to. Um, uh, Sujit Pal wrote a version of this in Scala, and it's much tighter code. So you've got a, a fluent API that you're using, essentially. Um, almost looks like JavaScript to me. But um, the, the Scala version of this is very tight. The Clojure version is also... A, a lot less lines of code than we have in Java. Um, it's also very tight. Uh, you know, Clojure is a very interesting language. It's, it's not as mainstream, but there's definitely use cases for it. Um, the main thing that I've seen, uh, by the way, this was done by Paul Lamb uh, at, uh, at Uswitch in London. Um, the main thing I see about Clojure is that if you want to take a, a petabytes of data and run it on a 5,000 node cluster for a week, that app represents a very significant expense, a very significant investment. So the closure people tend to have those kind of really large scale operations, and they have a lot of money sunk into making sure their app behaves correctly. Closure allows you to do some inference about the correctness, the provability of your algorithms in your code. They have a notion of code as data.
Uh, and really, this comes out of Prolog and Lisp, etc. So uh, this really appeals to the people working with super huge clusters. Now, in contrast, in Hive, it, it's really a lot simpler. You've, you've got your, your definition for your table, and then you've, you've got um, you know, just a single query could knock this down. The problem being that simple things in Hive are simple to do. Complex things in Hive are a real pain. Um, I work with some large e-commerce firms in Silicon Valley, and I was at a couple of them this week where I was hearing uh, very heated conversations about Hive. Um, one of them, actually three of them, are known for being very large customers of Hive deployments. Um, but the problem that they see is that once you've got a lot of revenue going through a complex workload in Hive, typically you're going to have some kind of processing on the front end, probably some Python scripts, and then you've got your SQL, and then you've got something on the other side where you take it out of Hive and move it someplace else. So these workloads are crossing two or three different language boundaries, and if there's problems you have to troubleshoot, it's very hard to cross those boundaries. If there's optimizations, you can't really do it. You can optimize the SQL, but you can't optimize beyond that. So um, as e-commerce grows up and becomes more and more enterprise, uh, we see people wanting to move away from Hive. But if you're just needing to get in and, and do some work with a large amount of data, I've used Hive at, at companies, and some of them still have it deployed at a very large scale. It's a very good tool for certain cases. Pig is also a, a data manipulation language. Um, this really came out of Yahoo, and uh, a lot of the context of Pig was, um, you know, not, not, not to diss anybody, but um, at the end of the day, uh, Yahoo was looking at a world where Google was able to attract the good people. Um, not to say, I mean, there's a lot of good people who went to Yahoo, but Google was really kicking them when it came to recruiting. Um, and Google runs these workflows you know, that they've got in C++ or, or other languages for, for MapReduce. What Yahoo did was to try to optimize more for hiring analysts who knew SQL and doing very large-scale workloads in a data manipulation language. Uh, so they came up with PIG as sort of a compromise there. It's, it's very useful if you want to get in and slice and dice some data. I have friends at, at Twitter that use some of this. But again, when it comes to Twitter's revenue workloads, they've moved it out into cascading. The problem here being that this language has a lot of uh, literals that you see there. Um, so it's going to be hard to assert what's going on. The other thing is that if you want to change any of the config or change any of the endpoints, it's a real pain. OK, so if I take a, a word count, I can drop in. I dropped in another operation. I scrub tokens. So maybe if I've got an apostrophe on the end of the word, I, I, I drop that. Um, what I did was I created a Java class. And it's just a few more lines of code, but it's a Java class. Java knows about it pretty well, but it becomes an operation in this pipeline. So I can extend this pipe in, in using the language tools that you know. If I go a little bit further, I could drop in a stop word list, basically knock out the naughty words, or knock out the words that are just too common that you really don't care about in word count. So for instance, and, and of, and the, and words that come up all the time, you knock those out. Um, this pipeline has a join in the middle of it, a join based on Hadoop. It's called a, a replication join, hash join. So what that means is we know, because of the shape of the data, that the left-hand side is generally going to be much larger than the right-hand side of the join, so we just replicate the right-hand side through in the mappers, and we can get a lot of efficiency there. And again, this pipeline is getting more complex. It still has one job step, one mapper, and one reducer. OK, so if, if I had that kind of work count, what I can do then is go in to uh, the point where I've got a token stream, and I can split it three ways, and I can do a little bit more processing. And now I calculate term frequencies, I calculate document frequencies, and I, I calculate in parallel the document count. So out of those three sub-assemblies, those three pipelines in the middle under the yellow, um, I come out with all the data that I need in parallel to calculate a TF-IDF metric. So if you've ever used Lucene or Solar, um, this is what's inside the guts of it. TF-IDF is what you use to calculate term vectors by default. And so now you've got this machine learning algorithm for search that's implemented as, as this kind of pipeline. Um, the next thing 
the, the last part of the series, and again, this is all on GitHub, by the way, um, but the last part of the series was we want to instrument this for test-driven development. That's a really big part of cascading. So, uh, for instance, we can do stream assertions. Um, I added different unit tests here, but I also do stream assertions so that when you're running at scale, you can have regex patterns that look at your incoming data as it's flowing through the graph, and if it doesn't fit the patterns that are required, it traps them, drops them out into a file so somebody can look at them, as opposed to having bad results propagated all the way through. Um, another thing that I put into here was uh, some checkpoints. So if you've got a large multi-step uh, uh, workflow, for instance, here, this one has 12 job steps. It has 12 mappers and 9 reducers. If it dies partway through, you can restart the job from the last good checkpoint. Um, we have one customer that runs cascading on a 1,000-node cluster, 250 job steps. It takes a week to complete. And uh, it's a financial customer. And <clears throat> you know, the thing is, if it dies two or three days in, they're, they're really interested in things like checkpoints. Um, okay, so if, if I want to deploy a cascading app, um, this, is, this is what it looks like on AWS. I, uh, I can use their CLI to spin up a cluster. I specify my jar file, and I specify all the endpoints, the input, the output, where I want the traps to go, etc. And uh, this is a lot easier to read on GitHub on, on the actual results, but uh, the documents coming in all talk about different kinds of rain shadow, and I just pulled a bunch of stuff off Wikipedia. And then I also threw in some garbage to just show that the traps are working. And for results, you end up, you see the keywords that are most specific to each document. Those bubble up to the top. You see the most common terms like rain and shadow down at the bottom with zero as their TF-IDF metric. That's how that's supposed to work. Uh, I have code here also linked for both the, the scalding and the, and the catalog versions. And then finally, I, I want to show a couple sample apps. So uh, we did one. We did a, a social recommender based off of the Twitter firehose. So the idea is that we, we wanted to look at, at people tweeting about a particular thing so we, we filter out tweets that appear to be about stock, people talking about stocks, ticker symbols. And then uh, we calculate a similarity metric and threshold that and produce a, a recommender so that people who are consistently tweeting about the same set of stocks could be recommended to follow each other on Twitter. Um, and we, we did this with Spring. Um, uh, Costin contributed to this on, on the adapters. Um, the, I, one of the interesting things about it is that uh, in the middle, where you're calculating the similarity metric, uh, that can become a, a cross product in a, in a naive implementation. Um, this code actually shows how to refactor that to run fully parallel. Uh, so that's one interesting thing about it. Um, we also show uh, taking a tap off of this workflow and feeding it into QA. We have some R scripts that we use for kind of a QA activity. Um, the results are built to be dropped into a key value store like Redis. Um, also, these kind of results would fit in really well for Neo4j for doing some social graph analysis. Um, they'd also be great for doing some topic modeling like with an LDA. And the results on that, um, you know, if I, I made a graph just to try to check the, the strength of the recommendations. And especially the ones that get up towards the, um, the top right of the graph, those are very strong recommendations. When I drill down on them and take a look at them by hand, um, come out with some pretty good metrics. And when you actually read the tweets, they make a lot of sense. Another sample app that we have, we did recently with Carnegie Mellon for a workshop at CMU. And this takes open data, government open data initiative from the city of Palo Alto. And what they did was just dumped out their GIS system data. It's really messy, not structured hardly at all. Um, but it's interesting because it, it catalogs all the parks and the roads and the trees in Palo Alto. So we took this along with CMU. Um, they, they have a, a site out in, near Palo Alto in Mountain View. Um, we took this and we also took a bunch of log files uh, from people walking around Palo Alto with their iPhones so that we could collect GPS tracks. And then we also have some, some curated metadata that we use for some of the business process. 
But at the end of the day, we, we create this, this enterprise scale app that um, tries to find, uh, if you're on a mobile device, tries to find a shady spot in the summertime where you can walk in downtown Palo Alto and take a phone call. And uh, here's a view in Splunk of the GPS tracks, some of the log data that we had. Um, but it, it, you know, up in the top right-hand corner, we calculate the probability of tree height distributed throughout Palo Alto. Um, do a little bit of analysis there after we got the data cleaned up. And then as far as recommendation results, um, there's one here that I picked out of the top of, of my recommendations. It's actually two blocks away from my train stop. There's a couple of American sweet gums that are, are very tall, and they shade about half of a city block. Um, so it's a, it's a really good place. It's also where I frequent. So the recommender worked out pretty well. Ready. Um, Okay, I can drill down into more of this, but um, I, I want to talk a, a little bit more about concurrent just at, for the wrap-up, and we'll take some questions. Um, we are a, a five-person company based in San Francisco. We are the sponsors of Cascading, and uh, it's, it's founded and run by Chris Wenzel, who is the main author of Cascading. Um, I'm also one of the committers on the project, and we're right around the corner from Twitter, a lot of uh, committers there as well. Um, so we have cascading.org, we have a lot of different repos in GitHub. Uh, we also have a, a public uh, a Maven repo, conjars.org, which a lot of third parties uh, have contributed and maintain adapters for other system integrations. Um, we also have a link there to our, our email list, and we have a, a meetup that we're starting. I'm going to be speaking uh, this evening at a combined meetup of DC Data Science as well as uh, uh, DC Hadoop user group. Um, so we're going we're gonna to have a little talk tonight. Uh, it's If you look on meetup.com um, or ask me, I can show you the URLs. But um, we're definitely trying to get out more to the developer community and talk about use cases, talk about patterns that we see in cascading. As well, we've been developing DevOps tools so that when you are running these large enterprise workflows, you can get insight into what's happening at the app layer, not just looking at it how do job step per job step, but seeing from the app layer, um, you know, what's all the rollups, what's all the data going through, what's all the tuples, where are the exceptions, etc. Alrighty, thank you very much. Question. Point. I'm, I'm going to put this up on uh, SlideShare right away, and um, I'll tweet. Uh, with the hashtag for the conference about it, but um, Pacoid PA. Oh, sorry, I, if I put this up to the top, um, let me put my contact info back up there. But um, at Pacoid is my uh, my Twitter handle, and I'll tweet about that later today. Or if you send me an email, I'll send you a PDF and stuff too. Um, other questions? Yes. That's a, that's a really good question. Um, yeah, I, I was doing a seminar for ACM uh, on the, over the weekend, and, and we had a, a pretty lively talk about that. Um, we were at eBay, but we had a lot of other people from Intuit and whatnot. So we had some, some good comparison and contrast from different organizations doing this. Um, personally, I've seen it break down in a few different ways. If you look at LinkedIn, they did most of all of their big data work came out of product. And so they're very, they're very oriented towards... Um, delivering products directly out of the data science teams. There's actually kind of an anecdote about that. Um, Monica Rigotti, um, one of the scientists there, a friend of mine, um, she uh, had some stuff she'd built on her laptop, and she's almost always at work, but one day had stayed home, and um, when she was home, sales called up and said, hey, you know, why'd you take down the service? And, uh, and they were asking what service were you talking about. It turned out they had sold something that was just running off of her laptop. Um, and so they were actually getting customers calling up about it. Um, so the, the thing is that they're very product-oriented. The actual individual teams are pushing out product. I've been in other organizations where this effort really reported into finance, where I reported to VP finance. 
And I actually found that to be a very good fit because the finance people are used to the idea of the, the variance in the data and explaining it and auditing. And they see a number and then they want to see what are the numbers behind it. Um, so I found that a lot of the problems that we grapple with can continually in uh, data science, um, you know, they, they have a different tool set, but they understand it. Um, and also, they, they understand the interactions in the business coming from the data. So that was a pretty good fit. I've been in other organizations where the big data effort was coming through engineering, and it was really focused just about engineering. That may or may not be a good fit. Um, the problem is that engineering already has a tool set, and they tend to want to pull what we're doing into the existing tool set. So data science, big data, is a lot about knocking down silos. And, and we see this over and over again, particularly in enterprise, that if you have organizations where you know, dev talks to ops by throwing it over the wall, um, then these kind of big data projects usually run afoul. Um, the way that we solve that is by having interdisciplinary teams where we've got DevOps working side by side with the scientist. And that's what I've done over and over. Um, when you've got the silos, that usually falls apart. Um, the other side of this is that I've seen a lot of big data efforts that were sponsored through marketing. Um, so actually, right now, I, I'm a data scientist at Cascade, or at Concurrent, but I'm part of the marketing budget. Um, in some organizations, that can be good. But marketing usually doesn't have as, as much of the, uh, well, for most companies, marketing is not going to have maybe the strength to, to pull a project through that engineering might or that finance might. So there's kind of a liability there. Um, having said that, marketing is usually one of the really big customers, trying to understand the marketing funnel and the customer segmentation. They're usually very concerned about that. Another area where you see a lot of big data um, where you really see, especially these kind of enterprise apps being driven, is from risk. So if you look, uh, particularly in finance, you look at the risk departments, they're the ones who are going to be pushing the use of Hadoop. All right. Other questions? All right. Thank you very much.